Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week, we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week on Common Ground, meet Jack McAllister, a Cuyuna country historian who takes us on a tour of a Native American portage route. Brian Atnison of Park Rapids takes us through the process of creating a board game the whole family can play. And Mike Wiltsey, a tattoo artist from Bemidji, really gets under your skin with his art. I wanted to share some of the history of the Indian portages here with, with others because it's uh, almost been lost to history, the, the stories of the portages through Cuyuna country. And I authored this booklet which was published by the uh, Cuyuna Iron Range Heritage Network. And they, they have published uh, three volumes, hardcover volumes of the Cuyuna country history of the, the people and the mining and logging and the railroads. I had some acreage near here and looking at the old uh, surveyors uh, drawings and their notes when they laid out the section lines and corners, uh, I noticed uh, they noted an Indian trail and uh, uh, in researching it, I discovered that this was an important Indian portage trail uh, from uh, the Little Rabbit Lake at Riverton to Rabbit Lake and from Riverton to Mille Lacs Lake. And it's pretty much been lost to history. There's a reference to it in, in a number of uh, other publications, but uh, no one's really followed up on it. The U.S. Parks Department had done a survey of uh, portage trails in Minnesota, and actually they missed this one. It's not recorded in their uh, reports or on their map. And it was a canoe portage trail. Uh, any, anyone in the area of, say, Gull Lake or North Long Lake or down, down maybe as far as uh, Crow Wing that, that wanted to go by canoe to uh, Sandy Lake or uh, Mille Lacs Lake, this is the way they would have to go. If you look on the map, uh, you can see that there is a chain of lakes going from here to Rabbit Lake, and there's a chain of lakes going south from Deerwood uh, to uh, Mille Lacs Lake. In the distance, you can see the, uh, where the Mississippi River would be, and this is Little Rabbit Lake and this is the public landing at Little Rabbit Lake. And uh, this is actually where the portage would start if you were portaging to uh, Rabbit Lake to go to Sandy Lake or, or to Aiken. Uh, because of the large bow in the Mississippi River, uh, from here to Rabbit Lake, it's nine miles shorter if you take this portage, as far as I can figure. And from here to Aiken would be uh, 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 quite a considerable saving to uh, there they would uh, go across country because if there isn't a stretch of water between here and Aiken as there is between here and Rabbit Lake and from Crosby and Deerwood they would go south uh, through Reno Lake and Long Lakes and Bay Lake all the way to Mille Lacs Lake. Yeah we're we're standing uh, by a, a small mine pit which is in the foreground. <clears throat> and in the distance is uh, Little Rabbit Lake and the Mississippi. And this is the uh, spot where they would be coming off of Little Rabbit Lake and taking a land portage to Portage Lake. Uh, before the mine pit was here, there was a strip of land that ran from Little Rabbit Lake up 
almost to here with a swamp on either side. And so that was the only place the uh, canoeists could uh, carry, carry their canoes was on the high ground. But the high ground's not here now because that was taken out by the mine pit. So anyway, when they got, got up to this point, then they had to go about a fifth of a mile through the woods till they got to Portage Lake. In the Cuyuna country, this would be the longest uh, overland portage they had to make. And the reason they portaged here was uh, they, were, they were following the Rabbit River, but uh, just north of here, the Rabbit River is, uh, drops so abruptly from uh, Pasco Lake to Little Rabbit Lake that it would have been impossible to canoe up upstream and that's why they had to take the land portage here. The uh, Ojibwe braves in their birch bark canoes could, could do some astonishing feats, I guess. They could, probably could uh, take a chance on going downstream through this white water, but uh, a little too much to go upstream, and that was why the portage from Little Rabbit Lake to Portage Lake, to avoid this stretch of the river. Now this, this uh, area, the county did get uh, a portion that runs from here to Portage Lake. And uh, my hope is that we can get permission from the county to brush the trail through from here to Portage Lake so canoeists could uh, recreate the portage from Little Rabbit all the way to Portage Lake and beyond to uh, Highway 30 and possibly to Highway 6. In some areas, uh, you can still see the depression where the trail ran. You can imagine 30 canoes and 200 braves on a war party running or trotting through here carrying their canoes. And uh, I always get a kind of a, a chill walking through there knowing that that actually had happened in the, right in this area. So far, uh, the trail doesn't have a name, as far as I know, uh, I, unless they would call it the Rabbit River Trail. The trail was used by, uh, since prehistoric times, by people maybe earlier than the Sioux. The Sioux were, you know, the Sioux were here before the Ojibwe. The Ojibwe came in and and by the 1800s, they had pretty much uh, taken over this, this country and taken it away from the Sioux. After the uh, Sioux had been driven out of this area by the Ojibwe, uh, and the Sioux were in southern Minnesota and Dakotas and so forth, they still were angry um, about the uh, you know, loss of their lands, and they would send war parties uh, to take revenge, and uh, they, they did have war parties, uh, there's this famous uh, story of their attack at Sandy Lake and they also had made an attack at Rabbit Lake which if, if they had gone from uh, the Mississippi to Rabbit Lake I'm sure they might have used this shortcut. Well anyone that's interested in history I think might, might just like to see if they could do what the Indians did. Uh, it would be a struggle to get from here to uh, number 30 or from here to number six, but I, I think people would, get, would enjoy the challenge and enjoy the scenery. It's be beautiful views here. And uh, I don't think you can, you can find a, a more beautiful place in Minnesota than this, this portage route. The idea for the game came with uh, having kids and uh, trying to think of a, a game that would be fun to play with. I uh, uh, wanted a game where the, uh, the kids, my kids, and, and their friends could all play, so I made it uh, a two to eight player game. And uh, that way no one's sitting on the sidelines. This was actually designed back about um, oh, 2000, year 2000 or uh, That's when it started. Um, from that point on, it's, it's evolved uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, initially, I was going to have a, another artist do the, the drawing and, and all the uh, work there, but I guess it kind of uh, became apparent that 
what was in my head as a vision wasn't going to happen unless I put it on the paper <laughs> um, or on the computer in this case. I try to keep the game surprising and um, keep people engaged and actively engaged in the action that's happening on the board itself. Uh, they're not just waiting for their turn to happen. So they have to pay attention because, you know, about five people are vying for the same treasure they are now. So the problem is what I put on the computer looks really good, but then when it comes to printing it, it looks a little different than that. And so being a perfectionist with uh, how it looks for the customer, I've uh, <clears throat> had to make a lot of samples to come up with something that comes close to uh, uh, my vision for what it should look like. When I first got the, the computer, I didn't know anything. I had um, I did it in paint, which is all just pixels and, and no special effects whatsoever. Uh, my son, my son um, borrowed me a copy of Photoshop, and um, I got playing with that and decided that this is fun. This is pretty neat, and I can you can do a you can make my visions happen. I'm, I'm very critical of my own work and how it turns out. And uh, so I'm, I always see something that could be tweaked and, and uh, made that much better. This is real experimentation there. <laughs> uh, looks like dark menacing water there. This is the nasty version of the game with uh, the shark looks more like a realistic shark, I guess, as, as opposed to cartoon. And of course the earliest one, that looked the nastiest with, uh, with the eyeball there and the sharper looking teeth if you will, around the volcano in the center. I, I fully appreciate that I am not an artist, <laughs> but, but with, uh, but with uh, you know, Photoshop, it can help you become sort of an artist, not, uh, not a Da Vinci or anything like that, a Monet or anything. But uh, I don't know, I, I, can, I can do stuff that I didn't expect I could, I'd be able to do. Uh, make, uh, make a couple of buttons, uh, produce a watery, bubbly effect. It was, it was really cool when I, when I saw that that could happen. I was like, wow, I, can, I can might be able to do something here. Uh, and then of course the special effects, making the letters kind of chrome looking, uh, sort of an Indiana Jones adventure uh, font there with a little bit of distortion to the font. Um, doing gradual color uh, changes with uh, gradient, uh, giving things dimension, giving them some dimension uh, rather than just flat cardboard cutout uh, type uh, characters. I kind of wanted to keep it a, a fantasy look to it, sort of a cartoon look to it, a, a fun feel to the artistry. Um, so I think I've, I've done that. At some point I have to let go of it and say, you know, I guess everyone else says it's good enough, so I guess it's good enough. Um, I, I'll keep tweaking on it and make it better. Started off in 2000 and uh, I got an apprenticeship over at uh, Tats by Zap in Duluth. And that's how long I've been professionally doing. I tried it out for a little while, kind of like out of the house, but um, I realized that I needed to be taught just it has to happen because there's so much you need to know that you just can't really figure it out. And by the time you do figure it out, you've burned through so many clients. So I started off you know, asking for an apprenticeship and then it took me about three years to get into it. And uh, they finally, I just ended up getting some, you know, the lucky break of like getting into the shop and did four year apprenticeship with uh, Tats by Zap and then uh, worked for a couple years at other shops just to kind of get some experience. I really just like, work and shapes and shading and amazing work. When I got my tattoo equipment, I was trying it out on my own. I was like, wow, I really want to do this, you know? And I really wanted to do it good, so like, that's where, again, I needed to get the apprenticeship. And so it's probably around 2000. And then, you know, I, I kind of always been an artist with painting and other things, but I've never really um, aggressively pursued an art career until then, you know? So then that's how I became to be in that kind of field so otherwise I mean if it was something that was a little bit more productive in the painting end or if you know I could take an apprenticeship as a painter I probably would have done that as well but um, as as it goes you know tattooing was really open and it seemed to be really popular at the time too, so. 
but there's other shops that are called street shops, and a lot of those have flash. And the flash are the designs that you see on the walls everywhere and stuff. And what it, those really entail is just a lot of tracing and coloring in and stuff like that. So you really don't have to have that much um, artistic skill. But you, you know, if you're really good at being very technical, that's something that's really an advantage. Um, but you know, when it comes down to the artistic aspect of it, it does help to have a lot of artistic skill or talent or um, knowledge of it. And so then that way you can manipulate your tattoos the way they should be to do, you know, specific designs and stuff like that. So I don't really design that much flash because a lot of the times I like, I like to let the people think about their tattoo first, you know, and then, you know, allowing it to be more of a custom piece, they're going to really kind of run through ideas that they really want on them. Um, sometimes they'll cancel out a lot of bad ideas, which is really good, whereas if you come into a street shop and you see the flash, it's, uh, it's called Flash because of its instant appeal. I mean, people look at it and go, I want that, you know. And in actuality, if you told them, you know, like six months down the road, you know, hey, this is going to cost you $200, they'd have been like, no way, you know. But, you know, because of the immediate time and the moment, that really, uh, that's what grabs them. And so doing the custom shop, they just kind of understand that now they're doing the thinking of like, maybe what do I want? And, and I'm helping them out by being able to facilitate the, the actual artistic aspect of it, you know, throw in my two cents, kind of give them something that's unique and different from just every old flash that you could get anywhere else. So. Some people really want something specific too, and they'll come to me as well just for, you know, like, there's nothing they can do to it. They just want that, and if that's just what they want. Sometimes I can talk them into something better, or I can, uh, you know, maybe relate some experience towards it. But you know, if it's if they really just want something, uh, sometimes I'll do it. Sometimes I won't because it might be just something of a lesser quality, uh, you know, thing. It's something that I could do better. And asking me to do something that's not up to quality is just kind of like, okay, well. You can go to the, another shop and get it done, but, you know, it's pretty rare. Most of the time I'll do, you know, anything they want, except for, like, uh, you know, racist stuff or, you know, gangster stuff and that kind of junk, so other than that. Uh, tattooing is a lot different from painting because it's like uh, it's being able to talk to your canvas, you know. <laughs> it's kind of weird that way. Um, I like the... It's like a lifestyle in general. It's, you know, a, a, a tattooing is not just, you know, just a business or just a, um, you know, just something separate that you go to every day. It's actually really a part of you all the time. You are always a tattooist. And so when you go out, out to a bar or you go out to the town and people talk to you, it's the first thing they bring up is a tattoo. And uh, so it, it, there's a lot more to it than just, uh, and just work. So I like everything about it. I mean, we have piercings and you know, just the kind of the whole genre of, of the tattoo culture and stuff. And it's really worked its way into the American system. You know, most uh, most time, most Americans are tattooed. You know, the majority nowadays are. And then you go overseas or something like that, and you'll notice that none of them really have tattoos, or none of them really into tattoos and stuff like that. So it's pretty amazing, you know, to see how it's all kind of developed you know, through everything, so. This is a good, good saying is to say, uh, is the difference between a tattooed person and a non-tattooed person is that a tattooed person doesn't care if you're tattooed or not. So, you know, it's kind of like the way it goes. I, I really don't, I don't really bother with it. And if people really are ignorant towards me, towards I, you know, I, I usually just kind of fluff it off because it's really not that much of an argument to even waste your time on. But, um, you know, some people have a strong terms towards it, like my grandparents and stuff like that. They're like, well, why don't you paint? You know, and it's like, well, if you understood, it's like, why don't you buy a painting from me then, you know? <laughs> it's kind of simple as that, you know? But, um, and then a lot of people like, you know, trying to get into uh, this building in general, we were encountered a lot of people had stereotypes that are old stereotypes of, of tattoo shops and stuff, where they was filled with like dirty sailors and a bunch of drunks and stuff like that, or drug addicts or just crazy people in general. And uh, it was nice to finally get in here and kind of show them that it's definitely not that. I mean, my dad, at one point said that it was a step up from a porn shop, you know? <laughs> but of course, I changed his mind on that when he, when he sees how, 
it, it definitely isn't, and it's not even close to anything like that. So, especially when you have like 60-year-old ladies in here getting tattoos, it's it's kind of nice to you know be like, I told you, it's not your rock or punk rock people, you know, all the all the time or anything like that. So we do, you do get some crazy people in here, but that's just the, you know goes with the turf. So, but to me, it's artistic stuff. You know, it's like a lot of like. If you're going into a, a shop, some people get it because they they just want to justify it for almost anything. Um, and some people actually go in just because of a, like a memorial piece or like a, what is it? Uh, there's all kinds of pieces that you know people get for different reasons. But I'd have to say the majority of them are like memorials and uh, or something that means something to them at some point in time. There's rarely a person that comes in and goes, just give me anything I want, you know, I, just, I don't care, we'll throw something on there, you know. And those those are fun because then they're allowing me to kind of do something and they don't really care because uh, like the guy I'm going to be tattooing today, he's like that. He's like, just go to town, you know, so I might draw a bunch of stuff on him and stuff. He's kind of a, gives me a direction to kind of go with and then I just take off from there. And this tattoo, Tim, I don't know if it really means anything, you know? I think it maybe means something to him in a sense that uh, it looks cool and that he can, you know, show it off and it looks really neat and everything. But, uh, you know, most people just get them, I, I think, for, you know, something, just something else that means something to him, you know? So to me, how they mean to me, though, is, is uh, it's artwork, it's permanently on, a, on somebody's body. It's eventually gonna go away, you know. All tattoos will eventually die off and you know, it's something that's not thousand years lasting, but um, the reputation kind of will stick around, you know. People will actually know of this person and that tattooed here. So that's, that's kind of like what they mean to me. This is like a long lasting impression on somebody, you know. Well, a lot of the times how we do it is when somebody comes in with a design or an idea for a design, I sit there and I talk to them. I ask them, you know, kind of specific questions about where they want it. If they want a black and gray or color, um, how big they want it. And uh, if it can be done that big, sometimes it, certain things just can't be done the right size or you have to take uh, drawings and kind of alter them to make them more tattooable. Um, a lot of times, so we'll walk, walk through that process, kind of get the idea shaped. I will uh, do some research on it if I need to. I'll go to uh, certain websites and check out different pictures and see what kind of things we can mix, mix, match to make the design. And then so I'll draw up the idea a couple of times. And uh, what will happen is during these drawings, I'll take some tracing paper, kind of go over them and you know, maybe switch some things up, make sure, make sure it's more two-dimensional design or so. It has some nice quality aspects to it. So I draw it probably about four or five times before I actually show the person. And then when I show the person, they look at it. If they want me to make any changes, we'll do that right there or something. And then um, after they've approved of the idea, then we book them down to the appointment and uh, we get a line sheet drawn up. A lot of the times, if it's not, if I'm not drawing right on the person, I'll be drawing a line sheet on a, on a separate piece of paper. A lot of technical stuff, you really need to do that with like, you know, like compass roses and Celtic and stuff like that. So and then I'll take that design and place it on them. Um, we'll first set up all our equipment in the room and at that time they'll be waiting out here. Um, once we have everything all set up then I'll go back and start outlining it. We'll, once we complete with the whole outline we start working on the, the shading and coloring right then and there. And then, then once that's done we give them uh, verbal healing instructions and then we also give them uh, written healing instructions so that they kind of have a, a good idea of how to take care of the tattoo. And then uh, once they walk out the door, it's up to them. It's their tattoo. As long as they take care of it, it should be just fine. Um, a lot of times that's, uh, that's where the artistic skill comes in. You know, if you uh, know how to do portraiture or anything like that, have you ever done portraiture, yeah, once you know how to do that, it's just learning how to manipulate it with the skin. Um, there's new innovations in different types of needles that we use now than when tattooing first started out. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do now with, the, with the, the, the amount of pigments, the types of needles that you use, and your artistic skill to create certain types of tattoos. We do a lot of, I, I love doing color portraits. They're really fun to work on and you really are working with a lot of flesh tones, so it's a lot of the same color that, of the skin. And uh, the effects that you can do, it just, just amazing, you know, so 
yeah, <laughs> the needles are something that uh, have changed a lot. Another thing also is we use uh, the types of healing knowledge and stuff like that really helps out. Uh, how you manipulate the machine while doing the tattoo will create a certain type of a uh, scab on your tattoo. A lot of the times it's not even, doesn't, people are like, oh, it's not even scabby. All tattoos scab just because they all bleed at some point. And uh, trying to create a thinner scab is the techniques we use a lot of the times nowadays. And that basically just places the ink in the skin without actually you know, really tearing up the skin at all. So that's where also like the apprenticeship comes in because you learn a lot about how to uh, manipulate your machine, the speeds and stuff like that in order to create a good tattoo. That's why you gotta learn it from someone. Otherwise, when you're trying to figure it out, you'll just burn through clients that way. <laughs> Nobody will go to you anymore. <laughs>segments or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.